Hey, good morning, Valley Assembly. We're so honored to worship with you this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, wherever you're at, right here in Spokane Valley, across the country, across the world, we're gonna lift up the name of Jesus together. Good morning, welcome to our gospel service this morning and so glad to get together again. Uh, we trust that you are uh, just experiencing God's presence during this time and would worship with us and sing along. The world can't take it away. I said the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. This happy face that I'm wearing, Jesus put it there to stay. And since the world didn't give it to me, the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it to me, and the world. and possessions I came into when I put him on the throne of my life. A 
conscience that clear and a family that loves me an antidote for heartache and strife the world always says that you can't take it with you but my riches transfer okay because the world didn't give it to me and the world And, you know, in whatever circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in, especially during this weird time that we're in now, Jesus is Lord. We can always count on the fact that Jesus is in control. And he's not only here as we're worshiping together here at the church, but he's with you. That's the awesome thing about the Holy Spirit. He's all over the place. And he's there with you. I am so excited about what God's going to do. 
He's got to turn this thing around and make it something special for his Christian people because he loves us. He wants the best for us. He wants the best for you this morning. We pray that in Jesus' name for you and every one of you. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give. Just as you are to us, come, just as you are before your God. One day every tongue will confess you are Lord, one day every knee will bow.
Father, as we have sing, sung of your power, of your greatness, Lord, of your holiness, your righteousness, your justice, and all that you are, Lord, I pray that we would begin to have a revelation of who you are again this morning as we've taken time to worship you and as we reflect back upon these songs and upon what you have to say to us, God. Uh, let your righteousness and your holiness and your perfectness uh, penetrate our hearts, Lord, that we would know you better. Lord, I pray for each uh, family that's gathered around uh, whatever they're watching this on. Lord, I just pray that you would bless those families and may they sense your presence there in the home. God, our hearts are, uh, go out to them. We want to be together, but Lord, we can be one in spirit at this moment. And lifting up your name and believing, God, that you are moving and interacting in these places, each place where we are at this moment, Lord. Um, Lord, I just pray a blessing upon on each one. We give you thanks and praise and we honor you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. On this day we remember. We remember your calling. We remember your courage. We remember your sacrifice. We remember your life. We remember what it cost you to pledge your allegiance to your country. Because of you, we can walk in liberty. 
Because of you, we can sleep in peace. Because of you, the flag is still there. Because of you, this is the land of the free. Because of you, this is the home of the brave. To the families and friends of the heroes we've lost, we salute you. Hey, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us again today. You know, I love garlic. Uh, there's this place over in Post Falls that we like to go to. I especially love to go to it. The only problem is when you leave there, you smell like garlic. And not only that night, but for the next three, four days, maybe even up to a week. I've got a friend whose wife literally will not let him sleep in the bedroom if he eats at that restaurant. So we had to stop going there with him. I like to cook also, and I love to cook with garlic. And I, if it calls for like a teaspoon of garlic, I use like four tablespoons of garlic. I love to infuse oil, olive oil with garlic. And you know, you can take some cloves of garlic and put them in, some, put them in olive oil and and bring it up to a just kind of a low heat and just let that oil just kind of simmer and in that garlic and uh, then you can mash it up and let it cool down so in 30 minutes or so you'll have some olive oil that tastes so great and it takes that flavor of garlic into anything that you place the olive oil in and I started thinking you know really that's kind of the way Jesus expects us to be with him that he infuses us with his flavoring with himself. And then everything we touch, every person we come in contact with, we make them smell like Jesus. We take that flavor and we infuse him into the world around us. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. God infuses us so that we can infuse the world. This morning we're going to look at this passage and Jesus begins with the statement, you are the salt of the earth. You know, salt is necessary. I used to have horses and we always had to buy a big salt block. Now that salt block had some minerals in it as well, but mainly it was the salt. And those horses, you wouldn't think that they would do this, but they would lick that thing down to where there was nothing left. We need salt. I was watching a, one of the many documentaries that we were binging on uh, throughout this whole COVID captivity. And uh, I was watching one on Glacier National Park, my favorite place in all the world. And there's a place in Glacier National Park called Goat Lick. I think we've got a picture here of these goats up on Goat Lick. Now what happens is, and in this documentary, there was a mountain goat mama who had a mountain goat baby. And she took him down the mountain they crossed a raging river. This little baby almost got swept away. And they went through the wilderness all the way to this place called Goat Lick. And it's just this sheer cliff. And you can go there throughout the summer and see many, sometimes 20, 30, 40 mountain goats climbing around like this. This thing is needing some salt. You've got to be desperate for salt to be able to span that kind of a gap and stand out on that ledge like that. Salt is necessary to animals. It's necessary in our diets as well. Salt is valuable. And in ancient times, not only was it just necessary, it was vital. Salt was used as a preservative. It's used as an antiseptic and added to sacrifices even in the Old Testament. In the Middle East, salt was a covenant of friendship. The Greeks even considered salt to be divine. 
In fact, Roman soldiers received a monthly allowance to buy salt. It was called a salarium. And sal, S-A-L, is the Latin root of uh, word for salt. And our word salary comes from salarium. And you've heard the phrases like, Man, she is the salt of the earth. What does that mean? It means they are just the greatest thing ever. This person is the greatest thing. Uh, He is worth his salt. That means he's worth every dime we pay him. Jesus refers to his followers, just ordinary people, as the salt of the earth. We don't think a whole lot about how valuable salt is in our day and age because we have it at just at, in abundance, big old cases like this. And uh, we have it on our dinner tables in every restaurant and you can just pick it up by the handfuls. But in olden times and in ancient times, salt was extremely valuable. When you're completely dependent upon salt for preservation and uh, even your salary, Salt takes on a whole different perspective. And when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he is saying you're valuable. You know, salt is a preservative. And uh, we have refrigerators to preserve our meats and our vegetables. But back in those times, they used salt to preserve their food. In fact, in the same way, Jesus is saying as citizens of the kingdom of God, We are to be a preservative ingredient in this world to preserve against moral decay in our culture. Uh, One author says, The spiritual health and strength of the Christian is to counteract the corruption that is in the world. Christians, as salt, are to inhibit sin's power to destroy lives. This in turn creates opportunity for the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to be proclaimed and received. Man, I want you to think about this. In my social media content, am I being the salt of the earth? Am I preserving the culture? Am I enhancing the culture of Jesus? What about in my conversations with family and friends? Am I preservative? What about my lifestyle? And we know this, by your voting, and we have some elections coming up, we need to vote biblically Look at the candidates and vote biblically. That is another way that we can be salt in this earth. Ask yourself this question. In what ways do I act as a preservative? Not only is salt a preservative, it also enhances flavor. (laughs) Back when I was a kid, I took a cooking class. And so I took this class and then I came home and I wanted to cook. I was probably fourth grade about that time. And I remember making chocolate chip cookies from the Tall House Nestle's chocolate chip cookie, uh, you know, package, the the recipe on the back. And and I saw one TSP, I think is what it was. And then I thought, okay, one tablespoon. So I took a tablespoon of salt. That's a whole lot of salt. And I put it in those cookies. We got them cooked and I ate that first bite and I was just, wow, that's a lot of salt. Salt is, salt is strong. You know, in our world, really, we can't have too much salt. But you know what? You know when you have too much salt, but you also know when salt is absent. Food is bland. It's flavorless. You know, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Allowing the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to season your conversation so that you will act as salt. So that what you say will be flavored well, will taste Christ-like. In Job 6.6 it says, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Have you ever had food where they forgot to put the salt in? It is so bland. Uh, Mashed potatoes or pie crust. It may be chocolate chip cookies especially steaks, and I love a good steak. If you don't put salt on it, it just loses something. And that's the way the world is when we do not act as salt of the earth. We are to have a major impact 
in our culture. You know, Christianity really has had a, a history of impact in our culture. We have made the world a better place in many regards. Hospitals, many of the hospitals were established in Jesus' name. Orphanages and adoption agencies, the Red Cross, uh, uh, the first 123 colleges and universities in the United States, almost all of them were begun by Christians with Christian foundations. Ask yourself this question, in what ways do I make the world a better place? In what ways do I make the world a better place? Another thing salt does is salt makes you thirsty. In fact, even just thinking about salt and talking about salt makes me thirsty. We're called to live lives in a way that make people around us hungry and thirsty for Jesus. Have you ever had someone say something like this? What is it that makes you different? Have you ever had someone say, why or how can you have so much joy and so much peace? For example, in the midst of this COVID captivity, when, like I said last week, and it continues to this day, I'm a little edgy right now. But when I allow the Holy Spirit to flow through me and I immerse myself and allow him to infuse me with the Spirit of God and the Word of God, then I can become salt. And people will look at my life and say, Kent, what is it that gives you peace? What is it that gives you joy even in a time like we're experiencing right now, when you can't go shopping, when you're supposed to stay home and not be around other people, when you can't even go to church, and, and really that is your people, those are your family members, and you can't be around them because of this COVID captivity. How can you have peace and joy in a time like that? It's because we have been infused with the presence of God and the word of God that we can be the salt. And that salt drives people. It makes people thirsty for Jesus. In what ways do you cause others to thirst for God? Ask yourself that question. In what ways do you cause others to thirst for Jesus. Sometimes I wonder if we have lost our saltiness. Jesus says, if salt loses its taste, then you just take it. You test it. And if it's lost its taste, you throw it out. And there are times they would just throw it out into the street. And people would walk on it. It'd just be trampled. You see, in Jesus' time, salt was collected and still to this day collected from the, the Dead Sea. In fact, I've got salt that I ordered from the Dead Sea on Amazon just a few weeks ago. But the Dead Sea salt, and one of the reasons I ordered it is because it's got other minerals in it, which is a good thing. But the problem is, if your salt gets wet and it's got other minerals in it, such as the Dead Sea salt, the salt is leached out. And what you're left with is a substance that looks like salt, but doesn't taste like salt. It doesn't act like salt. I think what Jesus is saying is that when we allow ourselves to be infused with the world, when we are infused like that garlic, like that olive oil, when we are infused with the impurities of our culture, those things that are not Christ-like, then we have the potential of losing the saltiness. For me, I've had to ask myself this question this past week. In what ways am I being infused by the world? Is it by consuming too much social media or binge watching too many TV or Netflix or Hulu or Prime or Disney Plus or whatever, CBS, All Access, whatever you're binge watching right now? Or are, are we just infusing ourselves so much with the world that we taste like the world rather than tasting like Jesus? 
In some ways, I think we've lost our saltiness. George Barna's group stated this, the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. The fundamental moral and ethical difference that Christ can make in how we live is missing. In other words, in many regards, we have lost our saltiness. Let me ask you this question. How salty are you? Now, trust me, I've asked myself this question first, and I've recognized that there are impurities in my life that uh, cause the saltiness to diminish. My goal is to become more and more salty, to be infused with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. You see, God infuses us so that we can infuse the world. Second thing Jesus talks about is the light of the world. (laughs) You may have noticed these are not real candles. See, they're battery-operated candles. (laughs) Kind of a funny thing. I, I don't have this in my notes, but a few weeks ago, I thought it'd be nice to light some candles. We had some very much like this on our on our uh, fireplace, and I took our lighter, one of those little propane lighters or butane, whatever it is, and I trying to light this thing, and I felt it first, and I, I said, okay, it's wax, it's a real candle, and I'm trying to light that, and I'm trying to light that. I was in the dark, and I keep, I keep flickering that thing, and it just will not light, and finally I turned the light on, and I realized this is a battery-operated candle, and I just ruined it. You know, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. Now, first, let me read this. In John chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then he turns around in Matthew 5, and he says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. All right, so the question is for me, what is the dilemma here? We've got Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And then he's saying, you're the light of the world. So which is it? It's both. You see, Jesus is the light of the world. And just, you know, my, my analogy is this. The moon does not produce its own light, but it still lights up the darkness. You know, when you go outside on a full moon, especially the harvest moon, it is so bright outside, especially when there's snow on the ground. It is almost like daylight. Why? Because the moon is brightly reflecting the light of the sun. And that is so much, a, such a wonderful example of what it means to reflect the light of Jesus. And go back to John 8. What he said is, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in, distance, in darkness, but have the light of life. In 1 Corinthians Paul writes, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. And then in Ephesians 5, 8, he writes, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. Jesus is the light of the world and he has placed within us his own light so that we could shine brightly. I'm in our auditorium here at Valley Assembly this afternoon and uh, I've got to say it's really eerie without all of you in here. It's really difficult to speak to a camera but if you were in here right now what we could do is turn off all the lights and it would be pitch black in here but all we would have to do is turn on one of these candles And it would give light to so much of this big, vast room. You may think I'm just one little person, but I want you to know this without any doubt. You are, if you're a follower of Jesus, the light of the world. So be the light where you go. You see, light exposes and extinguishes darkness. And just like this auditorium, if we were to turn on one little light, when all the lights are off, the darkness would be dispelled. In John chapter 1, it says, In him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not and cannot overcome it. In Matthew four sixteen, it tells us this, The people who were once sitting in darkness saw a great light, a little light, can overcome a lot of darkness. Another thing light does is it guides us. You know, 
the word tells us that it is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We also know that the light of Jesus can be like a, like a lighthouse, like a ship out on the ocean and trying to find the land in the middle of the night, searching the horizon, not sure where it's at. Then all of a sudden you see this lighthouse and you start headed toward the light. Let your light shine brightly and let the light of Jesus shine in your life so that he can be a light for you when you don't know what to do or what step to take or where to go. Even if it's just one step at a time, let God guide your steps and light your path. And remember this, as the light of the world, you then direct people. You guide people to Jesus. Does that mean you have to be perfect? Absolutely not. But as a human being, we can recognize I am fallible. Maybe I've lost some of my saltiness and maybe my light goes dim every now and then, but the light of Jesus within me can still point people to him. And quite honestly, I think it's when we're transparent and we acknowledge the fact that we are fallible, that we're not perfect, that people go, oh good, I'm glad to know that you're not perfect, but I want to be more like you. I want to know what you know. I want to have the peace, the joy that you have. I want to have the comfort and the foundation, the anchor for my soul that you have. So light guides others to Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes, do everything without complaining or arguing. <laughs> In other words, stop doing that on Facebook. That is not the place to have discussions. So that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Are you following in the light during these dark times? Or are you walking in darkness? As a child of God, you can walk in the light, even if it's only one step at a time. What about this? Are you a light guiding people toward Jesus? Ask yourself that question. How are we infused with the light of Jesus. Well, we're infused <laughs> by Jesus when we come into relationship with him. First of all, before you can shine for him, before you can be the salt of the earth for him, you've got to know him. You've got to enter into the kingdom of God and become a child of God. And, you know, quite honestly, it is something that is very, very easy and at the same time is one of the most difficult things we do because it means saying, I humble myself. I recognize that I cannot save myself. I cannot be good enough. And I'm going to place myself at the mercy of God. And we come to God and say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life on the cross to pay the price for my sin. And I submit myself to you now. I am yours. And we take possession of that light. He places his light within us. This morning, if you're watching and you haven't ever begun your relationship with Jesus, you can pray a prayer very simply, just like that. Jesus, I want to be yours. I receive your sacrifice and I commit myself to you. You see, he will do that. But then we need to immerse ourselves in him, in his word. We need to immerse ourselves in his spirit so that he can infuse himself into us so that we can infuse the world with his presence. I want to encourage you would, you, would you do this this coming week? Think about ways every day, salt and light. Remember those two words, salt and light. Each morning when you get out of bed, ask yourself, how can I be salt and light this day? And get in the habit of letting the Holy Spirit and the Word of God infuse you with the presence of God 
so that you can infuse the world. Let me pray with you. Father, my prayer today is that those who are watching, and myself included, would say, Jesus, we pray that you would expel the impurities in our lives. And Father, there are things that you will bring to our attention, each one of us, that we need to remove from our lives. Maybe their attitudes, behaviors, or things that we immerse ourselves in that bring impurities into our lives so that our saltiness is diminished, so that our light is hidden. And God, I pray, first of all, that you'd help us to recognize those things and remove them, repent from them, turn away from those things and turn to you. And Jesus, we ask that you would infuse us with your Holy Spirit, with your word, so that we can be salt and light in the world that we live in. And Father, if there are those watching today who have never asked you to take over their lives, I pray that they would have the courage to pray a prayer like this. And if that's you this morning, pray something. It didn't have to be word for word, but something along these lines. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for accepting me just like I am. Thank you for loving me. I receive your sacrifice on the cross as payment for my sin. And I choose to give myself to you now. I'm yours. Mold me and shape me to become who you've called me to be, to be like you. Infuse me with your Holy Spirit and infuse me with your word so that I can infuse the world around me. In Jesus' name. And Father, for each one of us, may we be the salt and may we be the light of the world that we live in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you and thank you so much for being with us this morning. Man, what a great message from Pastor Ken. I know I was encouraged. I pray that you were as well. I just want to invite you to stay connected with us throughout the week. Every single day on social media, we have posts, we have devos. You can stay connected, be uplifted, and I know it's going to be meaningful for you. On Facebook and Instagram, make sure you're following us there. You know, it's been amazing every single week seeing the amount of food that continues to come into the church food pantry and at the same time, the amount of food that goes back out into the local community and the homes that need it. The season that we're in, it's affecting each and every one of us differently. And the Church Food Pantry is here for you. Or maybe you know someone that you can bless with a box of food that needs a little extra help. Every single Wednesday from 4 to 6, our Church, our church Food Pantry is here to help fill that need and continue to love first. As well, every single Wednesday, we host a Zoom prayer meeting. Make sure you email Lori at Valley Assembly for the invite. It'll be a powerful time of gathering together in prayer. Don't forget, we created a digital connection card. So if you have a prayer request or a praise report, go to valleyassembly.org and take a moment and fill that out. We would like to follow up with you and celebrate with you or pray with you whatever season you're in. I love that message. God infuses us so we can infuse the world around us. You know, I'm encouraged to be a part of a community that believes that God's spirit is going to come and fill us and empower us to make a difference in our world, to love first where Jesus has planted us. You know, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 writes to the church in Corinth who's known for their generosity. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You know, I'm so encouraged to hear ways that we're loving first, that we are living out generosity, infusing our world with hope and God's love. Some of you are bringing meals to your neighbors. Others are staying up through all hours of the night, providing medical care for those around you because they don't have anyone else. And I just want to encourage you to keep doing that good work. You know, another way that we respond to God in generosity is through giving financially. 
And uh, I'm encouraged by this verse that reminds us that God is the one who provides all that we need in all times, in every season. So as you give today, just know that God is giving generously to you. He's infusing you with grace, with his spirit, and know that he will continue to bless you as you respond in obedience. God bless you today. Have a great Sunday.